Well, you might not know her story, but if you've sung in many church services, I bet you have sung the words she has written. Fanny Crosby is the author of more than 9,000 hymns. One that I love is Blessed Assurance. Here's a few words from that hymn. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. We've been talking about the promises of God recorded in the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation 21 records a vision given to the apostle John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, by the time John was writing these words, he was an old man. He was a young man when he had seen Jesus, experienced his ministry firsthand, but now he is coming to those sunset years, probably looking back with fondness, but even more looking forward to what was ahead for him. Now, John's words are meant to give us that blessed assurance that Fanny wrote about and to help us look above as we watch and wait for Jesus to return for us. I hope you've been following along. We really have been soaking in this passage for a couple days, but my life is a testimony that we cannot hear these words too often. So let me read to us Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Underline those words, former things in your Bible. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Here's what Revelation 21 has done in my life. It has run a steel rod of truth straight up my back. It helps me stand for the gospel in ways that no other passage really does. And here's why. Because Revelation 21 puts everything in my life into two categories. I had a short stint as a secretary in college and I struggled with the filing system because there were so many different categories, different colors of folders, different places for things to go and Revelation 21 gives us just two, two categories. I am a farm girl and so the farm girl in me likes to think of them as two buckets, former things and eternal things. That's it, former things and eternal things. There's no third option. There's no gray area. There's just former things and eternal things. This passage has given me a new filing system for everything in my life. Either it will last forever or it is destined to pass away. It's either a former thing or it's an eternal thing. The list of former things is listed for us right here in Revelation 21.4. He, the he is Jesus, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Tears, former thing. Death, former thing. Mourning is a former thing. Crying is a former thing. Pain is a former thing. All physical pain your body will ever experience, it's a former thing. All heartache your heart will ever experience, it's a former thing. Everything that is broken in our culture and everything that is broken on us, they all go in the former things bucket. They're goners. They're circling the drain. I like to think of it with a different word picture. They're expired milk. 
they're just waiting to be thrown out. Now, sure, they might stink, but it's not something that I am going to have to carry with me forever. We think about our own lives. We think about what keeps us up at night. What makes our stomach tie in knots with anxiety? What keeps us from worshiping because we're so consumed with worry? What fractures our human relationships because we just can't let it go? All of those things will ultimately end up in the former things bucket. And yet those are the things that we spend the most time thinking about, the most time trying to fix, the most time venting about or talking to others about. And scripture is saying, put them in the former things bucket. It's where they belong. They're destined to pass away. So what remains? What goes in the second bucket? Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter one. I'm gonna read us Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. You, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. These verses give us this language. They perish. They wear out. God will roll them up. Well, what are the they's and the them's in this verse? What's everything listed in Revelation 21 for? Tears. They will perish. Pain. It will be rolled up. Death. It will be gone. The broken earth beneath our feet is a former thing. But force your heart to sit in this for a moment. Hebrews 1.11 again. They will perish, but you remain. You can think about anything in your life right now that's causing you grief or sorrow or anxiety, and you can look at that thing and say, they will perish, but you remain. Here's my deepest area of sin and need. Discouragement, which often veers all the way into despair. I will wake up every morning and drive my life into that sin ditch every day without the Lord's help. I'll wake up and find myself discouraged before I've even had my breakfast. This is especially true in every area of ministry. Motherhood where I'm trying to raise four boys to be warriors for the kingdom. I feel discouraged in that space every day. Serving in my church. I'm sure your church is like my church in that it is full of sinners. And it can be so discouraging to serve alongside sinners. Loving my neighbor sounds really lovely until I practically try to do it and it's hard. Leading women to know and love their Bibles is a great passion of my life and a great source of discouragement because so many women that I know and love aren't opening their Bibles. And bearing with each other in love is a ministry all unto its own and a place where I fight chronic discouragement. Without the perspective of God's word, I would always be discouraged in those areas. And being discouraged inevitably erodes our joy. Without the perspective of God's word, I would be a discouraged, fruitless, miserable Christ follower. And that's not who I want to be. So here are the three words that lift my eyes from my discouragement every day. You ready for them? Three words. But you remain Jesus, you remain. All of this will pass away, but you remain. I will always face discouraging circumstances, but I need not always face discouragement. Because what recalibrates my heart, what re-energizes my work, what refocuses my eyes on the mission is the permanence of Christ and his kingdom. 
Which brings me to that second bucket. What goes in that bucket? That eternal things bucket. It's so simple. Only three things go in that bucket. God goes in the eternal things bucket. Psalm 102, 12 says, but you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. God is an eternal thing. God's word goes in the second bucket. 1 Peter 1, 25, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Isaiah 40, verse eight, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. My Bible goes in the eternal things bucket. One more thing, people. God's people will exist with him forever and those who do not know him will exist without him forever. All people are eternal things. That's it. Just three things. God, his word, and people. Those three things will exist for a million years. Those three things will exist for a million, million years. I don't know the numbers that are bigger than those, but as many, as far as our numbers go and beyond that, God, his word, and people will exist forever. They're eternal things. And this is the reality of Revelation 21 that has changed my life. It is what shifts our hearts away from the challenges we face, away from the challenges we face, and away from the challenges the people around us are facing. Everything from minor annoyances to major heartbreaks has to go in one of the two buckets. God's word helps us see that so much of it is a former thing. Now, if you're listening to this and you're in the middle of real pain, real sorrow, I want you to hear me say this. I'm not saying those things don't matter. God cares about the details of your life and he asks us to carry the burdens of others. But what I am saying, what Revelation 21 is teaching us is that those things won't always matter. Sharing the gospel, Christ's work in our own hearts as we're being changed into his image, the people we spend our days working beside, the children who sit around our breakfast table, the Bible which we spend our days reading and living, those things will remain forever. There's a Helen Rosevere quote that has deeply impacted me. If you don't know Helen's story, she was a missionary to Central Africa in the mid-1900s. She's with the Lord now. But while she was serving on the mission field, she saw a civil war break out. She was arrested. The medical facilities that she had worked years to build were destroyed. And she was beaten and violently attacked. Yet whenever she would talk about living her life for Jesus... She would always talk about the privilege. I've been captivated by these words in particular. Looking back, one has tried to count the cost, but I find it all swallowed up in privilege. The cost suddenly seems very small and transient in the greatness and permanence of the privilege. That thought of the greatness and permanence of the privilege of living my life for Jesus has changed me. Helen's words in particular have changed the way that I pray. I frequently pray like this. Jesus, there is no cost to count here. There's just the privilege. And that is truly how I feel about living my life for Jesus. And it's not because it's easy and it's not because there's not speed bumps, but there is no cost to count there's just the permanence of the privilege. There's just the fact that everything that matters goes in the eternal things bucket. That's not some pie in the sky thought that doesn't have any weight to it. Following Jesus cost Helen plenty. And Jesus never tricked us into thinking it wouldn't cost us. 
He promised us it would cost us. And we're living in this culture where for some of us, we're experiencing for the first time following Jesus costing us something. And there's just the permanence of the privilege. At the end of the day, or God willing, at the end of my life spent serving Jesus, there's another prayer I've prayed often, especially when I'm in nursing homes or around people at the end of their lives. I say, Jesus, wring me out like a washcloth. I want to be in those final years and those final moments with just nothing left to give because I've been so squeezed by the Lord for his glory. And so at the end of what I hope my life looks like, where I'm just wrung out for the glory of the Lord, there's just the permanence of the privilege. There's just the eternal things bucket. Whatever it costs us to follow Jesus, we should pay it. Because we have the hope that God's work in us and through us can never be taken from us. It's already in the bucket, the eternal things bucket. There was an 18th century pastor and theologian who would pray this prayer, Lord, stamp eternity onto my eyeballs. I have that written in the margins of my Bible next to Revelation 21 because that's what this passage does for me. It sears eternity onto my eyeballs. In my flesh, my eyeballs want to look at this moment in time. But this passage stamps eternity onto my eyeballs. This is the reason why Revelation 21 has changed me. Why I hope it's changed my family. Why I hope it's changed my small group, my church, my community. Because it has taught me to focus on what goes in the eternal things bucket and to hold on very loosely to everything in the former things bucket. I was traveling recently, and you should know I'm a head down traveler. And the woman next to me was trying to strike up a conversation. I was putting off the vibe that I didn't want to talk, but she wasn't picking up on it. And so she started to tell me this story. It was an unbelievable story. I Googled it later because it seemed so unreal what she was telling me. And it's her story. I won't tell it here. But the bottom line was that her family had experienced such tremendous horror and grief. I couldn't look her in the eyes as she was telling it to me. And she finished the story and she looked to me and I knew she wanted me to tell her something, but I didn't know what it was. And so I asked this question, are the promises of God true? Because this woman was a pastor's wife, she was a woman of faith, and I needed to know if God really keeps his promises in a valley so dark I couldn't fathom it. She looked at me and she smiled. She said this, every single one of them. God had kept his promises to her in such incredibly dark moments. And barely on the other side of that darkness, she was declaring that God keeps every single promise he's ever made to his children. I think of her so often and I can't wait to see her in heaven and tell her how that story has transformed me to know that these promises in Revelation 21, which frankly feel too good to be true, are going to be kept because does God keep his promises? Every single one of them. I want you to think about Fanny Crosby again. I read to you some of her lyrics from Blessed Assurance, and here's some of her story. She was a blind hymn writer, and someone once said something to her about what a pity it was that God did not give her sight when he had given her so many other gifts. And this is what Fanny said. Do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind Because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. In many ways, Fanny's reality is our reality. When we get to heaven, all will be revealed. And we'll see in full for the very first time the precious gifts that Jesus has been storing up for us. 
and this is our blessed assurance. Former things are going to take their rightful place as things that are no more. They're goners. And eternal things, God, God's word, and God's people will be ours forever. Lord, stamp eternity onto our eyeballs. Amen.